Good Monday morning. It's been a wild one already for me. I hope y'all are having a good Monday. The sun uh, rise was absolutely gorgeous this morning. Um, but today we are going to go over chapter 19, the epistles. And um, I'm excited because this week we get to start on some doctrine. So I'm excited about that. I hope y'all are having a good day. Today has been wild for me already. So I'm going to wait for a few of y'all to come on and then we'll have our Bible study. Um, Mama, last night, uh, called me up and she was seeing ants in her bed. And of course, they're really not ants in her bed. But to her, there really are ants in her bed. So she... Uh, called me up, fretting all over, you know, about the ants, and I said, Mama, I'll bring you some clean sheets, and we'll change the bed, and she said, okay, so I took clean sheets over there, and of course, she, when I got there, she had the bed stripped, um, and I put the clean sheets on there, and I put powder all in the bed, and said, oh, ants don't like powder, and and she went back to bed, you know, she got in the bed, and she calmed down, and I sat with her for about an hour, and I left, this morning I get a call. She has fallen out of the bed. And I was get I've, every time I go over there, I get on to her for how she gets in the bed. Because she should scoot her little behind up against the, you know, scoot her legs up up against the side of the bed and then sit down with her behind. But she wants to halfway get on the bed, just barely sit on the edge of the bed. Um, and she knows that it's dangerous, and she knows she can fall, and she'll even tell me sometimes, you know, that, you know, she's liable to slide off the bed. So I, you know, I tell her when I go. The whole reason I went over there last night about the ants is so that nothing bad would happen. Well, guess what? She fell off the bed this morning. So they called me this morning about 7.30, I guess. She calls me. Tammy, you're going to be mad. I said, what? She said, I fell off the bed. I said, you did? She said, yes. I just slid right off of it. So I knew her butt wasn't on it good. And I said, well, who's there? She said, the, the, there's a man here. I said, well, let me speak to him. So it was the uh, fireman. He was there checking on her. And I said, look, if all she did is slide off that bed, I don't want y'all to transport her to the hospital because every time y'all transport her in an ambulance, it cost us $250. It cost $250 copay with Medicare to be transported in an ambulance. I don't know if y'all know that, but she has United Health Care with Medicare. They'll charge you $250 both ways. So you're, you're charged $500 if they take you and pick you up. Now, of course, if it was an emergency, I would not mind them getting mom in an ambulance and paying $250, but I just paid $250 last month because she fell, and that one was more legit because she was bleeding. She had a little cut on her hand, on her arm. Of course, nothing major was wrong with her, but still, you know, this morning I said, don't transport her if she's, you know, if her vitals are okay and all that. So they called me back, and they said her vital signs were fine. And that she didn't lose consciousness or anything like that happened to her. So, um, the story is, once I got her back on the phone, is she was looking for ants. Now, when Mama starts in with her dementia, she sees bugs and she sees worms. And let me just say this. I was over there the other night and I watched TV with her for a while. And I don't ever watch regular TV, but they have a commercial, and I'm sure some of y'all have seen it, for eczema medication. And it shows ants crawling all over your hands. It shows worms coming out all over your skin. And that has just got to be the most craziest commercial. And if they only knew what they did to old people and scared them, Mama said when I was there, see that commercial? Those bugs start coming out of you in 16 days. It means that the medicine starts to work in 16 days. And really, bugs don't come out of your body, but she thinks that they do. <coughs> so anyway, it's just been a fiasco. So I've got to go check on her this morning, but I drove all the way over there and changed her sheet so she wouldn't think bugs were in her bed, and she did anyway. And then she failed looking for them this morning because she told me she was looking for them. 
If any of y'all had this happen, please let me know if you know of anything that works. Because uh, if you tell her there aren't any bugs, of course she gets mad at you. With that said, that's the kind of morning I've had already. It's been wild. And Chris is in Florida. I'm glad I didn't go because here's two things I already needed to be home for. Um, but thank goodness I read my Bible lesson last night. I had a good day yesterday. I read a lot in Acts. And then I read my Bible lesson before I went to sleep last night. And it's a good thing I did because of my wild morning, right? But we're going to go over the epistles this morning. 30 days to understanding the Bible. I'm sorry I'm late. But I told y'all that, you know, it's hard for me to stay right on the schedule with the kind of life that I have. I have teenagers and I have a mother and, and that's just the way it goes. But we're starting at 9.06 this morning. And I'm, I'm happy y'all are here. And, um... It's the epistles, Romans to Revelation. Hey, Sandra. And um, this is, um, let's see, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to give you a synopsis, I guess. It says, Paul and other writers of the Bible had similar concerns for people they loved. They wrote letters to both the church congregations and to individuals to encourage them to, and to instruct them. In the providence of God, these letters were saved and eventually compiled in the epistle section of the Bible. The epistles were simply letters. There were 13 epistles written by the Apostle Paul while the remaining nine had a number of different authors. The chart, and then he gives us a chart. Okay, so we just talked about the Apostle Paul in our last section. He was the first missionary, and he actually writes a lot of these letters, okay, to the churches and to individuals as well. Um, it says, um, it shows us a chart to show us when and when these epistles were written. And then he gives us an overview of each epistle. But it says the epistles are letters to churches and to individuals to instruct them, which is a blank that you fill in, instruct them, and encourage is a blank, encourage them. Good morning, Donna. In the Christian faith. Um, there are, and it says there were four main, there are four main topics, okay? The first one is the nature of the epistles, which is the doctrine and duty. It says there, these are letters written to the churches, individuals, or in some cases to the Christian public at large. They deal with specific problems and issues of the day, but do so in a way that the information is universal and timeless. In other words, they would apply to us too. The typical pattern is to write a section of doctrinal truth and follow up with the practical implications of that truth. Doctrine, then duty. Duty. I said duty. <laughs> duty. Principle, then practice. Number two, Pauline epistles to the church. Thirteen of the 22 epistles of the New Testament are written by the Apostle Paul. Nine of these are letters to local churches, um, and then he explains the uh, letters, you know, in more in detail. Like, for instance, Romans. It says it's heaven, it's heavenly doctrinal with most the most complete doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in all of the Bible. So, if you want a good book to read on salvation. The book of Romans is a good one, okay? Then it says, um, sec, first and second Corinthians are he heavily practical, dealing with a series of specific problems in a Corinthian church, okay? The Galatians is written to some of Paul's first converts, refuting legalism. Now, that would make sense because when we talked about the geography and we talked about Paul's first missionary journey, we talked about him going to Galatia, which is the closest to where he was when in his travels. So it would make sense that he would talk to the Galatians 
about legalism because Christianity was so new and they were still uh, felt like they were bound by the law. Okay. So that makes a lot of sense if you put those two together. Um, then we have Ephesians, which deals with believers' position in Christ and its practical implications. So if you want to read, if you want to read a book that's more about the believer, the set, you know, the, us that are saved, and our position in Christ, you would read Ephesians. Okay, then we have Philippians, which is a warm letter of joy despite trials. So um, that's a good one to read if you're wanting to uh, have some joy in your life and see the joy in your salvation. Uh, that's Philippians if you want to take a look at that. Then you have Colossians. It is the preeminence of Christ as its major theme. Then you have 1st and 2nd Thessalonians that are very personal letters dealing with specific issues to the Thessalonian church. This includes prophecy and practical living. Now, the next number is the Pauline epistles to individuals, which is number three, because there's always four subjects uh, underneath the main subject that he gives us. And the Pauline epistles uh, to individuals are 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. 1st and 2nd Timothy are letters to young pastors in Ephesus to counsel them on local church issues and encourage them to remain strong in their faith. Then you have Titus, uh, which is written to the pastor of a church on the island of Crete, and it deals largely with local church issues, including the qualifications for church leaders. So lots of times when people want to look at the church leader qualifications, they go to Titus. Then you got Philemon, which was written to a slave owner, and it urges lenient treatment of a runaway slave who has become a Christian and is returning to his Christian master. That's a really good one. Very interesting read. And that is Philemon. Okay, number four. We have the general epistles which are letters to Christian public, which is to us. So these letters are written more to us um, as Christians. And they are Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Okay? So if you want to read uh, books that pertain to the Christian and not... You know the Jews or a certain a specific church at the time then you would read these books Hebrews is heavily doctrinal um, it's uh, about the teaching of the New Testament truth to a Jewish audience so Hebrews was actually written to a Jewish audience uh, and while we're on that subject let me say this yesterday at church we had a missionary from Israel he grew up in Israel and he was he was I and mean, he is a Jew, and he grew up, they were very devout Jewish people, and um, he said that in the third grade, he had a friend named David, I'm going to get a drink of coffee, and he said his friend David was a Christian, and that David had talked to him a little bit about Christ, of course, when they were young, and he had invited him to church. And he knew he couldn't go to church with him because his parents wouldn't allow it because they were Jewish. And he said they celebrated um, their faith on, I believe he said, starting Friday night into Saturday, I think is what he said. He said, um, anyway, he, he told us his... Uh, he told us how he grew up. He told us what all he was interested in as a teenager. Um, how he uh, always just felt empty. And um, he told us about his older brother was really, really smart. And he only missed two questions. I can't remember if it was his sister or brother. He had two siblings that were 
extremely intelligent. One of them only missed two questions on the SAT and got a full scholarship to Cornell University. And the other one was just as intelligent and became a lawyer, I believe. But he said that, uh, of course, he wasn't like them. And he said that he started playing sports and he got pretty good at sports. And um, so he said, but once the sports were over, you know, I, I can't remember what he said he did when he first got into college, but he, he just he just didn't ever find his niche, in other words. But he said that he was 23 years old and, he's, and he had already graduated college and went back home. And um, his friend David was still his best friend and he was, you know, a Christian guy. And he said, and I never really was that interested in what David had to say to me because I just wasn't interested in being a Christian or, you know, I was, you know, I just wasn't. He said, but then one day I decided that I would go to church with David. And he said, the only way I could do it was to, I couldn't like get up on Sunday morning. I was 23 years old, but I couldn't get up on Sunday morning and just put on a suit because mom and daddy would know, you know, something was up because nobody worked on Sunday. It was forbidden. And they knew that, you know, if I were going since they were Jewish, I shouldn't be putting a suit on on Sunday morning. He said, so I got this bright idea. I would just start spending the night with David on Saturday night. So that's what I did. And he said, I went to church on Sunday morning. And he said, and I heard the gospel for the first time. And he said, it really, what you know, it was, it was stuff I'd never heard before. And he said, I remember... Um, mentioning something to my parents about the Old Testament and he said that they didn't read the Old Testament and they didn't believe in reading the Old Testament and um, anyway needless to say he started going to church with David and he loved it and he got saved and once he got saved he got baptized and he wanted to start working so then he started teaching and working in the ministry and he would just always just spend the night with David. He said that in Jewish custom, when you're devout Jewish, if your family finds out that you have, uh, you know, went into another religion, they actually disown you. They actually, he said, would have a funeral service for you. So once his family found out, of course, he was cut off. And he said that was, I think he started going to church in 1986, and then his family cut him off in 1987. And he said, so my older brother absolutely wouldn't have anything to do with me. And then I had a sister that would, he said, nobody would at first. For years, he didn't get to talk to his family. And, um, but he told his whole testimony and about how his daddy never got saved. But then after his daddy passed away, uh, he said it just killed him because he wasn't able to, you know, convince or talk to his daddy about Christ enough. But he said that once his daddy passed away, his mother looked at him and said, oh, she said, I want you to do the funeral. And he said, he said, it made me understand that God works in, you know, God's time and God's working is different than ours. He said, where I would, you know, when I really wanted my daddy to be saved, it's not that Christ didn't, I mean, God didn't want him to be saved. He just knew he wasn't going to get saved. He said, but then he opened the opportunity for me to preach his funeral. He said, and of course, my brother and sister didn't even come to the funeral because I was going to preach the funeral. But he opened up a, a way for me to talk to my mother. And eventually his mother gets saved, uh, and that's really sweet. Uh, she doesn't get saved until she's about to pass away, but she still did. So uh, he got to tell his story, and it was really sweet. And eventually he has a sister that started talking to him again, and he gave me his book that he wrote, and I'm excited about reading it, that talks about um, that kind of stuff. But he's an actual missionary in Israel and has a Jewish family, and his daughter has just joined the uh, military there uh, because that's just part of the core. Um, and 
so y'all keep him in your prayers. His last name is Ross, R-O-S-S. But I found that very interesting uh, that we had him come in. And of course, here we are talking about, you know, the Jewish uh, religion and how the legalism was set in and how they wouldn't accept Christ as the true Messiah. And, um, and then we had that missionary come in and tell us that beautiful story this Sunday, which was just a blessing. And I'm sure his book will be a blessing too. So I will have to let y'all know how uh, the book is. Chris has gone to Florida. So I will have a little time on my hands. I'm excited about it really, to tell you the truth, because we have not been apart since the beginning of summer. Uh, and not that I want to be apart from my husband. It's just nice to get a breather. And those with, of y'all who have retired husbands know exactly what I'm talking about. And, um, but I just thought that was really sweet. Uh, I loved having him there yesterday. We went up to his table and we got to see a little box. Uh, and I forget what he called it, but I'm sure when I read his book, I'll know more about these things. But they had a little box and it was carved on the top. And Amy uh, Huff, Huffendinger, I can never say your name, Amy. I wish I, wish I could. But she's Jewish and she watches the Bible study sometimes. But she'll know what I'm talking about. But it was a box. And inside of it is scripture. And each of the Jewish homes keep one in their home somewhere. Uh, but May went up to the table with me and she had questions for him, of course, May. Uh, and because she has an inquiring mind, you know, she wants to know or whatever. Uh, but it was, it was just really interesting. So let's get back to our Bible study, right? Um, but this is, uh, let's say we we're talking about, let's say, we talked about the book of Hebrews, and it was mostly truth to a Jewish audience. And these are the things y'all need to, to take notes on. I know that the Bible applies to all of us, okay? But there are, there, it still has a structure, and it was written for certain groups of people. And certain chapters or books are written to different groups of people. And when we read it, we're supposed to keep that in mind and not just apply a scripture to us and think that we're taking it in context when we're not, okay? So this kind of helps us. It says that James is an incisive and practical treatment of the proper outworking of Christian faith in everyday life. So we can read James and it completely apply to us, okay? You got first and second Peter, which is written to believers scattered throughout Asia and Galatia. It deals with the proper response to suffering and opposition. So if you're suffering through something or you have an opposition with someone, this is a couple of good books to read. That's first and second Peter. Then you got first, second, third John, which are letters from the apostle John dealing with the love of God and it's outworking in Christian lives, which are really blessings, all three of them for us as Christians. Okay. And uh, then you have Jude, which is a brief but powerful, powerful book warning against ungodly living. And, of course, it comes right before Revelation, which talks about uh, the nature and uh, order of the end of times. Okay. So um, that is pretty much it with the, the epistles. Um, and then, of course, he gives us a, a thing in the back as a test. But now, we're going to read this end part because we're about to start a new section. It's very important for y'all to listen and read your books and take note in this because it applies to us for sure, and that's the doctrines of the Bible, okay? It says, congratulations, you have just completed a basic overview of the story of the Bible. All 66 books, y'all, from the historical books of the Old Testaments and the New Testaments, you have learned all the main eras, all the central figures, and the main locations of geography, all tied together with the storyline summary of the chronological story of the Bible. You have also learned where the other books, the poetical, prophetical books of the Old Testament and the epistles of the New Testament fit into the chronological story of the Bible. You are now ready for the next section which will give you a general overview of the 10 great doctrines of the Bible. I'm excited about that. 
I'm excited that we finished this. And y'all know what? I was talking to my friend. She came over and ate with me the other night. I don't know if y'all seen me on CBC cooking. We cooked the steaks that night, and then she came over and ate. Um, and I was telling her about this Bible study, and it was amazing how much that I've learned through this first part of this book. I mean, through, you know, what we went through already, uh, that I could recall in my mind, and I could see the places on the map, and I can uh, think about the different eras and, and how one makes sense to come before the other one and how they fall into place. Um, and it's amazing how much I can recall from this Bible study. And it's mainly because he does such a good job with repetition, repetition, repetition. And he makes us write it down and write it down and remember. And it helps us remember. But I'm excited about that. Um, and I hope to keep applying it uh, throughout, you know, the, the next few months and years to come. I hope that I keep going back and refreshing my memory because it helps you have such a better understanding of what you're reading. Uh, just like just like as simple as me saying that the church, you know, Paul's book to the Galatians, um, when he wrote the letter to the church, um, because we know the history of the New Testament, we know that was his first missionary journey. We know it was closest to his home. And we know it was one of the very first times he had to deal with legalism, which makes sense that he would deal with legalism in that book. So all that stuff starts making more sense to us as we learn, uh, as what from what we've learned from this book. It is such a blessing. Um, and I'm excited about it. Now, the doctrine overview Bible doctrine, even if you haven't been a part of the study, even if you don't have a book, uh, this is a whole completely different section if you want to join in. And I'm going to go over just what we're going to review just so you'll have an idea of what you're going to learn about. Okay? The Bible. God. Christ. Holy Spirit. Angels. Man. Sin. Salvation. The church. Future things. Ten doctrines of the Bible. The Bible, God, Christ, Holy Spirit, angels, man, sin, salvation, church, future things. They go in order when you think about it. The Bible, God, then comes Christ, then once he ascends, he gives us the Holy Spirit, all right, and then the angels, of course, they were created early, before man, so you got the angels, then man, then sin, because he sins in the garden, then salvation, a way for us to be saved, then the church, and then future things. So, we get to learn about all of that, and it's going to be good, 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 good. And I've been reading in Acts uh, because I had somebody make a comment, and I would like to reference it, but I'm not going to reference it today because I've already been on here for a while. So maybe I'll do that tomorrow because today I did talk about the missionary. Y'all, please pray for my mother and her seeing these bugs, and I know that to her these bugs are real. Pray for me that I will have patience because today, after she fell, I said, Mommy, you weren't seeing bugs. You don't have bugs in there, and then she got mad at me. It is so hard to know what to do. You go in and you pretend you see the bugs to help appease her, and you change the sheets, but then the next morning she falls looking for bugs. So then you want to say there are no bugs. But then when you say there are no bugs, then she gets all frustrated and gets mad at you because she really and truly believes that there are bugs. It's a real issue. It is a real hard thing to deal with. Dementia is so hard, and Alzheimer's is too. Now, Mama, what's so frustrating with Mama is with dementia, with Alzheimer's, they just kind of gradually go. So you either, you, you just kind of gradually see them. But with dementia, it's a roller coaster. One day, they can think straight, sharp as a tack, and the next day, they're seeing bugs. And what's so strange about dementia is that she can be talking completely crazy one minute, and then know everything she's talking about the next minute. 
it is so wild. Uh, so you have to spend time with them. I mean, last night when I got there, I, w I wound up staying like an hour and a half or so. Because if you do, then you don't just see the crazy part. You get to see some of the good at the same time. But please pray for her. Keep her in your prayers and pray for me that I have patience. Pray for the staff that they'll keep an eye on her a little bit better. Because I know this is gross, but Mama, once she starts seeing bugs and worms, she thinks they're coming out of her skin. She thinks they're in her stool. She'll even look through her stool. So they got to watch her because they got to make sure if she does something crazy like that, that she washes her hands. It is a real issue, y'all. It's really hard. So um, let's just pray for everybody involved with that and everybody that's going through things like this today. Um, so we'll say a special prayer for my mama today. I hope y'all have a blessed day. And um, I plan on getting lots done this week with Chris Gone with my cookbook. So pray that I get to do that. Sandra said, it's hard. My dad had dementia. So did my mother-in-law. Prayers for you and your mom and you. Thank you, Sandra. Let's say our prayers, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this book. We thank you for this Bible study done by Max Anders. And we thank you so much for him continuing to put a new cover on his books and keep this book going throughout all of these years that it has been in existence. Um, just help us be Christians. Help us to have patience. Um, help me to have patience with my mom and the staff. And I pray that her dementia spell will um, get better or something. They might find something to do for her so that she doesn't be so afraid of these bugs. Um, I thank you for everything you do for us. I thank you for getting Chris to Florida safe. I pray for all of those uh, who are part of the study that you would be with them throughout the day and help our light shine. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I guess I'm going to head to see my mother. I think I'll call. She might be asleep again. She, she likes to sleep till like 11 o'clock. I told her this morning, I said, you just go back to bed and I'll see you in a little while. But anyway, we'll talk to y'all later. Thanks for watching, Real Southern Woman. Bye, I love you.